Thank you so much for having me again. Uh, I am actually quite nervous. I normally don't get that nervous while speaking. I've done it a lot, but yeah, today I am a bit. So um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about my journey. Um, I run a SEO agency in the UK. Uh, we won 16 awards in the last two years, including uh, best uh, large SEO agency, three years running at the European Search Awards. Um, don't worry, it's not all going to be bragging. Um, last year, we sold uh, to Omnicom Media Group. So my uh, journey of running an agency um, has, uh, has ended quite well, uh, and I'm still running this. But it wasn't all plain sailing, and that's what I would like to tell you about today. Um, in fact, uh, you could say that for a long time, I was testing gravity, basically falling flat on my face. Um, and um, I think this is a really good learning that I would like to share with you, uh, maybe preventing you from doing the same mistakes. Um, we have a very unique way of measuring results at Verve. So we are primarily, um, we are an SEO only agency, but most of our work goes in the off page, so link development. Uh, and we measure uh, the value of links. Um, and we have been measuring this for uh, a very long time. And as you can see here, the value of uh, the kind of links that we're able to contribute to our clients declined year on year. Uh, and by uh, end of 2014, we realized that what we were doing wasn't really working. Uh, and this is where kind of my real journey started. Um, so I would say that dividing SEO into three um, kind of sections is quite normal. Tech SEO on page and off page. And we all have different views of which uh, is the more important or what kind of percentage. But in terms of process, I think it's fair to say that the biggest part of the process is the off page areas, right? Um, I would say, though, most agencies and most people uh, spend most of their time actually doing the on-page and the tech and not the off-page, which obviously skews then the results of how well they can do. So off-page um, is kind of where we specialize. And I think um, by 2014, we saw a lot of articles like from Matt Cuss and stuff saying things like, if you're using things like guest blogging as a way to, link, to gain links, um, you should probably stop. Uh, a lot of people spent a lot of their time removing links um, uh, in, the, in the years from 2012 to 2014. Uh, yet, I don't think that much has changed in terms of what we're doing. Like the session from um, this morning, we were talking about how technical SEO might be um, uh, not really what you should be focusing on. So I would like to kind of take up on that. So, for example, did you know that um, Total number of blogs, this is the href um, research, total number of uh, blogs selling links by niche in verticals like travel is as high as 48%, 44% in 2018. That is a lot of links being sold. Yet, a lot of you uh, and a lot of the industry in general use blogger outreach as the main method of link development. That is really, really risky. The reason that that is really risky isn't necessarily that whether you are paying for the link. Let me just break it down like this. If, if you buy a link from a, a, a blog, you know that that's risky. If you don't pay for it, but that same blog charges someone else from a link, it's just as risky. And also, let me put it this way. It, you might not pay for the link. You might get a blog, uh, a blog link, and then a month later, this blog starts charging for links. That is then risky again. So if your main method of link development is reaching out to these blogs, um, that is actually really risky. Not saying that blogger outreach can't be useful in loads of other things like branding, etc. But in terms of link development, I think it's actually really fruitless and also really, really risky. So in 2000 and, uh, January 2015, we totally changed our strategy. Um, I had a huge content team, and that's why I called it. Most of it was uh, people writing content and then reaching out. Uh, doing blogger outreach was a big part of what we did as well. Um, but I closed that content team down and started something completely different. Um, I would like to share a stat with you. Um, this is the US stat. So 50% of all website traffic in the US goes to only 74 websites. That's 50% of all traffic goes to only 74 websites. 
Websites like this. Now, it differs from country to country, but there are a few of them that get uh, uh, repeated over and over again. Uh, you probably can guess what kind of sites they are. Um, but the point here is that if you actually target um, bloggers and, uh, and their smaller sites, you're not likely to get traffic. And again, this is where I think a lot of us are missing the, 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 the big clue. Targeting the big sites is what you can do to snowball to get more than just that one link. Also, those sites are more likely to be really high authority and give you more for um, your efforts. So we started creating campaigns that deserve more than just the links, that deserve to get the traffic, the social share, and so on. So now the campaigns that we do for link development regularly gets print coverage, it gets radio coverage, even gets TV coverage. Uh, our work also regularly gets shared by high-profile organizations. Like my, 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 my proudest moment was uh, when NASA shared a piece we did for British Gas. And also high-profile figures. That is a more sustainable strategy. If you create campaigns that deserve, deserve more than just the link itself, not for SEO. And this is what Google have been trying to tell us for years. Try not to do SEO, try to do great content. And that seems like such a simple thing, and you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But it's so difficult. I'm gonna show you a few examples, just so you can see that it doesn't need to be that difficult. So uh, this is a campaign we did uh, for a client in the UK called Party Casino. And as you might know, uh, working in SEO, uh, there's, it's really difficult to rank for um, uh, kind of gambling terms. So what I think is really important when you come up with campaigns and stuff in, uh, for SEO is that the idea needs to be the important thing. Don't try to do loads of other things like trying to sell the brand or sell the product. It's about ideas. So this idea was basically um, trying to analyze Hollywood um, movies uh, and actors to try to figure out which actor is the most bankable, which actors gives the highest return on investment, for example. Um, which, is which is linked to gambling because it's about, it is pretty much gambling, <laughs> um, making a movie. So it isn't closely linked, but I think it's good enough. And it is content uh, that in content silos belong to, uh, to a site like this. So the most surprising answer for this, and this is why it worked so well, was that Emilio Estevez turns out to be the most bankable actor of all time. That's right, Mighty Ducks. <laughs> And that angle really, really worked. In fact, this was the first time ever we got the New York Post with a follow link. In fact, we, don't, we didn't only get New York Post um, a link on the website, but we got coverage um, in the print paper on page three with mention of the client. We also got Fast Company um, and E! News. And this is maybe the most surprising one is that we got a load of TV coverage. E! News had a 10-minute segment where they printed out our campaign, reading out stuff about what they found surprising, etc. Now, if an SEO campaign can got that kind of TV coverage and that kind of additional coverage, do you think Google will deem it as dodgy? No, it's just marketing. But it got the follow links. In fact, it got over 165 links and over 6 million views. And it's not a rocket science campaign. It's not so incredibly creative and new and whatever. Use what you already know what to do. You know how to find data. You know how to, um, to crawl. You know all these things already. It doesn't need to be difficult. I also um, think that a really if, a useful um, uh, strategy to do for creative campaigns when you work in SEO is collaboration. So we work with a client in the UK called Lenstore, which is... Um, a contact lenses online, um, and we wanted to do a campaign was, which was really ambitious, and it was creating an image of London that was in like huge quality, uh, and we also wanted to do it as a time lapse, um, so um, throughout uh, the night, so basically seeing it throughout the night and being able to zoom in to like incredible detail. Um, like you can see here, you can actually see the clock tower in the far distance, and you can zoom in. But we didn't have the equipment and the ability to do this on our own, and neither did Lenstore. So we teamed up 
with Nikon and ask them if they want to collaborate on this project and also supply the photography equipment and the photographer because we didn't have that. Um, and they said yes, people are really willing to collaborate. You just need to ask them. <laughs> that is it. We also created some additional um, stuff like behind the scenes video stuff and uh, GIFs for Twitter which have worked amazingly well. But I think the real kind of key in these kind of campaigns is, is not giving up when it gets difficult. Like we had loads of no's. For this campaign, for example, the most difficult thing wasn't getting Nikon on board or even getting the links or anything like that. It was where to take the photograph from. Because we, we needed somewhere in London that could see pretty much everywhere of London. And we needed permission from that building to use it. And we had, at one point, we had permission from all these buildings, um, Oxford Tower, uh, the Gherkin, and Heron Tower. But it all fell apart for whatever reasons. And it turned out that this project took much longer than we thought. But the important thing is not to give up. Uh, this campaign just launched um, a couple of months ago, so we're still outreaching it. Um, so far, it's had 111 links from really high authority sites, including CNN. Um, CNN, I believe, has one of the highest, um, so the biggest Twitter profiles in the US. Um, and so far, 350,000 views. Uh, and that has made a huge impact on this client's rankings. Um, another one is uh, a tip, again, to make, it, uh, make the campaigns better. For Go Compare, which is a comparison site in the UK, uh, we created um, a campaign looking at Hot Wheels, you know, those uh, cars that you might have had as a kid. It's very 80s. Um, and we, uh, we looked at how valuable those cars are now. But we don't have the knowledge. We don't have the authority on this. But there's people that are expert in anything on the internet. And this guy knows everything. In fact, he's written books about these. Um, so we, got, we contacted him and asked if he wanted to collaborate. And he was more than happy to collaborate because he's passionate about Hot Wheels. And so he gave us loads of content. He gave us loads of quotes and made this one of the most successful campaigns that year. Uh, it was the end of last year. And it's had 398 links and over 2 million views. Again, it's not difficult. It's a very simple premise and a very simple campaign. But the trick here is to work with an expert, is to collaborate with someone. It's about finding that data that's surprising. Because what journalists uh, are struggling with today is that they usually have like 15 articles they need to write a day. They want content. They're screaming for content. They just want, don't want your shitty infographic or your article that you already written for them. They didn't become journalists so that you could write the articles for them. So, okay, so these campaigns are cool, but does it increase rankings? So, Lenstore, which I showed you with the uh, London uh, Skyline campaign, after 12 months and five campaigns and outreach, their uh, main term, which is contact lenses, have uh, gone up from position 12 to position 2. So, yes, it definitely works. Party Casino, which uh, obviously in gambling is very, very uh, competitive, went from uh, position 33 to position 10 on first page. And that was in four months, because that campaign did extremely well. Go Compare, we worked with for, for years. Um, they're a very competitive industry, and this is obviously a big site. So that had, uh, has had a 10% increase in visibility uh, year on year. So this. This kind of strategy definitely, definitely works. And I tell people all over it. Like, I speak at conferences all over Europe, and I tell them exactly what I do and why I do it. But people still don't do it, and it's really frustrating. You can all do this. We don't need to do crappy work. We can all um, put our minds to doing something bigger, something better, and it will be much more worth it. So I often get asked, like, how do you do this? What is the secret? How do you get BBC to link to you? How do you get NASA to link to you? You know, and most of the time, people think it's the tools that we use, uh, which I think is a bit ridiculous, because it's a bit like thinking that you can build a house by holding a hammer. You know, it's not going to build itself. And the secret to this is actually people. And that is the main thing I want to talk to you about, because that is entirely um, what has made Verve the business it is today. So I've recently got a, um, uh, got a mentor, and my mentor, uh, Margaret Heffernan, did a TED Talk, so I'm going to uh, try to summarize this TED Talk because I think it's a great example. Um, so uh, a guy called William Muir, 
uh, a biologist at Purdue in university, definitely not pronounced that right, um, he studied chickens. He studied chickens because he wanted to uh, study productivity. And with chickens, it's really easy to, uh, to study productivity because you just count the eggs. Um, and he did an experiment where he wanted to figure out how, um, uh, how you could get more productivity out of these chickens. So he found that chickens that laid uh, loads of eggs, he thought, I'm going to divide them all into a flock of super chickens, chickens that are all really productive. So he put them in one flock, and then he put another flock with completely average chickens. This sounds so ridiculous. Um, and he uh, studied them for six generations, pretty much left them alone, but studied them for six generations. What he found at the end was really interesting, um, because he obviously thought that the flock with the super chickens would be the ones that would have done the best. But the average flock, who was completely average, they had done pretty well. In fact, they had increased their productivity over time. But the super chickens, there were only three left of them. They had all pecked each other to death <laughs> because they had only achieved their success by suppressing the productivity of the rest. And I think this is a typical kind of syndrome of any organization where we think we just hire more talented people. If we hire talented people, we will do better. It's a bit thinking like you have a football team or a soccer team uh, full of strikers, then you'll get more goals. That doesn't work. You need to have midfielders and wingers to be able to pass the ball to you. In fact, the one thing that really makes an a, a organization successful isn't talent, it is teamwork. And that, I think, is a big part of how we, uh, how we become successful. Um, and so I want to divide it in a few sec sections, like number one, finding the right people. And I think a lot of people do this wrong, especially in our industry, because I think experience is kind of bullshit. <laughs> because if you think about it, in, in an industry like digital and an industry like SEO, um, it's not about what you knew last year or 10 years ago. It's about, can you solve the problems when everything changes tomorrow? That is what is important. So hiring someone that were able to do SEO in 2005 is frankly stupid. Can they do SEO tomorrow? That's the main thing. So I think we, not, we need to think a little bit uh, broader and we need to think a little bit more ahead. I also think that people, um, uh, that, that we need to think more like SEOs do, like as, as in the right people might not actually think to apply to your job. And that is because most people don't know what outreach executive is or even what a link developer is. It might be the perfect person that can actually do that job amazingly well, but they would never identify with your job description. So what we do is we do what we always do. We write loads of different versions of the same thing. So I tend to write different job ads with different titles for the exactly same job. And this has actually done me really well because a lot of the people that work at Verve applied for jobs that wasn't outreach or wasn't SEO, but was something more similar to what they were doing at that time. Because CVs are often a shortcut to missing talent. Because what is coming tomorrow um, is not what was work, what we've already been. And I think the most important thing to find in people is grit. Grit being a, a mix of passion and perseverance. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about someone that works at Verve now. This guy, Andrew, uh, he worked in a sports clinic, um, so like a back clinic in, uh, in the town that uh, Verve is. And I had done my back in, I had to go to this um, back clinic, and he was the, the, the junior person that had to like hang out with me every time I was uh, in this machine thing. And as I was talking to this guy, I realized that he had so much else about him. Like, he was a gamer, uh, and he was really interested in anything digital. But he got into sports therapy because he was from a small town up north, and that's what kind of everyone did. He didn't know that there was any other professions um, out there in digital that might have been exactly the right thing for him. So I started talking to him and, um, and realized that he would be really good at outreach. The way that he behaved, the way that he talked, the way that he thought really, really um, works for uh, people that work, um, 
really is the same as the people that are in my team in outreach. So I asked him for his opinion on a campaign we were doing um, that was about uh, gaming. So I said, why don't you come to the office and just give your opinion on this um, gaming campaign? So he did. As he came to the office, he looked around and said, oh, wh what exactly is it that you guys do? So I started explaining about um, what we do, and he asked so many questions. And he asked questions that only people in SEO would ask. That curiosity, that's like, well, how does that work? And then ask again, ask again. A couple of hours later, he sent me an email saying, I really want to work a verb. I have, I have no idea um, what it really is, but I really think that I could learn really fast. In five months, this guy outperformed pretty much everyone in the team. He had uh, results that was over 167% above his target, and he had never even worked in an office. How many more talented people like this are we missing every day? Because we're looking at experience. We're looking at what they've done before, or we're creating job um, ads that doesn't actually um, get the people that would be good at the job. I also think that it's about finding people that are different to you. In fact, I know a lot of people say you need to find people that are smarter than you. Sure, but I think it's more important to find people that are different uh, because that's where you get the real kind of creativity that lies in, uh, in different perspectives. So my head of operation, uh, she's like the yin to my yang. Uh, we do this behavioral profiling uh, testing called um, a DISC. It's similar to Myers-Briggs. I know that a lot of people think that that's only fluff, but I think that this is really important tool to use. Not necessarily to whether it's right or wrong, but it's quite good to see um, a trend in how people work. And so my head of operation is literally the opposite to me. And that is exactly what I needed. I needed someone that was good at the things that I wasn't good at. And this has significantly improved the way that I work and the way that the agency work because we have different strengths. So using things like these kind of uh, behavior profiling tools can be really useful. Not, not for saying, no, I can't hire you because you're not an extrovert. In fact, I'm not saying that at all. But it's really good to see how people fit together by their um, way of thinking. Then developing people uh, is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and I think the most important part of a growing agency uh, that needs to be pioneering, that need to think about new things all the time, is actually lies in not being agreeable. Um, a guy called Adam Grant uh, did a, a, a TED talk and written several books about this. And I'm going to use that, although I've changed all the references to Star Wars references, which totally makes sense. So, um, you know, we all know the people that are disagreeable in any organization, that are disagreeable um, and, and will argue for anything. But what is important isn't whether people are agreeable or disagreeable, it's about what the intent is. Why are they disagreeing? And you can all probably think of someone that is disagreeable, that are takers, that only wants to get something out of it themselves, which is obviously Darth Vader. Um, and these are quite easily recognizable. You can also uh, quite easily recognize people that are the agreeable givers. Like, anyone want to be Jar Jar Binks? Oh, he's so annoying. Um, and, but it's harmless, right? And there'll be loads of people like that in any organization. But the really scary people are the agreeable takers. The agreeable takers, they will smile to your face, but they will stab you in the back. And before you know it, you're in um, Jabba the Hutt's basement. <sighs> Thank God there's some Star Wars fun here. Um, but the really useful and important people to have in any organization, you need as many as these as possible, are the disagreeable givers. The ones that are willing to disagree with you because they want to make it better. Obviously, Yoda. He will hit you with a stick, but it will be for your own good. And I really think that this is the most important part of growing and developing teams, is teaching them how to disagree, how to ask questions. So I have a few things that um, I do, um, some of them are a little bit harsh, um, I do for this. It's like encouraging people to ask questions. Like one of the things I do is um, sometimes when I hire loads of people at once, um, I'll put them in the room, I will print out a piece of um, random articles, uh, maybe I think this one is about Native Americans from Wikipedia, and I will ask them to read it. 
and they will read the whole thing, and at the bottom it said, why the f did you read this? You didn't ask why you read it. And this is a bit harsh, I must admit, but it does really shock them into start asking questions, saying like, why exactly do you want me to do this, Lisa? Um, and I want people to question me too. Okay, so um, you also need to show them the way. I think this is also very un under... Um, uh, estimated. So developing a competency framework has made a huge difference. So um, I know Rana has talked about this loads. Um, doing things like single contributor and management track, there's so many shit managers out there and that is because a lot of organizations hasn't got a way for people that aren't necessarily people people and managers to develop in their career. So please make sure that you develop a uh, track where people can still achieve even if they don't manage people. Um, and then make it very clear what they need to do in each step. So I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to um, uh, carry on. So um, I think the most uh, impressive thing um, and most uh, shocking thing that I've learned in the last uh, five years has been what actually accountability is. So, you know, that got thrown, uh, thrown around all the time. Um, and I realized that the only thing that uh, really develops accountability um, isn't developing accountability to whoever is at the top, but it's trying to develop a, a kind of a bond and accountability through people um, that work alongside each other. So I have a few things that I do at Verve that really helps with this. So uh, anyone use Slack? Um, we have a Slack channel um, where we uh, thank each other. So this I've kind of stolen from a, 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 a I've stolen the idea from a, a a, a tool, but we have a Slack channel that basically is all about thanking each other for helping uh, each other. It could be the smallest little thing. This has a huge impact. I did one, I opened this channel, did one time thank someone, and since then, and that was like three years ago, since then this has been going. Every day someone is thanking each other. But the most interesting one, and this one uh, is the big one, is that we have a thing called Love Week. Love Week is basically you pick uh, someone's name at the start of this week, so it happens every quarter, um, and you do something nice for this person every day for a week. Uh, and it could be anything. It could be like making them a cup of coffee, it can make, make them a playlist, buy them a balloon, but you have to do it in secret. And we do this, like everyone does something for someone and every, everyone receives something. And we do this every day for a week and at the end of the week, we reveal who our secret angel was, etc. cetera. Um, we've been doing this for three years. And um, I was telling you at the start that we have this like, metric of being able to measure the, uh, the value of links and stuff that we use in our, our entire outreach team. So I have done some data on this for the last couple of years. And we have actually found that the only thing that increases performance is not pay rises or bonuses, it is Love Week. So doing something nice for someone and receiving and having that kindness between, between each other is the only thing that actually increases performance. Okay, lastly, so I think the real culture thing is uh, when it grows organically. Uh, this uh, just started happening this year, where someone at Verve um, came up with this idea of every time they got a link that was really high authority, they would, um, uh, they would give this little whale to that person. And then this whale is passed to the next person that has got this really big link. Um, and it's based on Moby Dick, apparently. Uh, but this happens all the time, and they get so excited being past this tiny little thing. And what I find really amazing about this is that I had nothing to do with this. None of the managers had anything to do with this. They just started it themselves. And that, I think, is what culture really is, when things happen organically. So to wrap it up, I just want to say that I think that the... The main thing that you should do as managers, as leaders, um, and as SEOs is that you need to take care of people. You need to take care of people around you, and that is what then will take care of the results. Um, and that's a happy team. That's all I got. Thank you.